Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let me give my um, court of welcome to those who are present here with us this morning. We want to say welcome to faith, welcome to, to worshiping with us today. And for those who are online, we also want to acknowledge your presence because you too will be hearing the message this morning. And so, let me just say, if, if you are online, whichever platform you are watching us from, welcome. If it's YouTube, Facebook, um, wherever it is, welcome to worshiping with us at Faith here um, today. I want to also say thank you to those who have led out in the service so far, and for that um, Musical meditation, no one else can take our sin and our darkness away except Jesus. And that's very appropriate for the message. Sometimes I wonder how the musicians are able to choose such appropriate songs. But we know why. The Holy Spirit is leading. Now... I have two disclaimers before I start. And the first one is one that you may know. I'm not a preacher like Pastor Harvey, but we can all teach. Yeah. And so whenever I am here, I'm normally timely. I'm not too long in my messages. And so the second disclaimer today is that past performance is not indicative of present or future performance. <laughs> You're laughing, that means you understand what I mean. <clears throat> now, the topic of our uh, message this morning is, as you can see on the screen, we are studying the book of Romans. We have a series and we have some um, sermons in the past. Last week, the week before, Elder, Elder Peterson and Pastor and others have already set the foundation for what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, um, last week was communion, but the week before, Elder, Elder Peterson dealt with, with how, how um, I think he dealt with Romans chapter 2. Uh, and so and into the beginning of chapter 3. And so he dealt with the, the human condition, how we were in this sinful condition, and it's no different from the, the world today. And so we are going to take a look at, um, last week, the, the, the preacher also introduced the gospel, and this week we're going to look at the gospel. And so we are looking at, What's the law got to do with the gospel this week? Um, bow your heads with me as we um, seek the Holy Spirit presence here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for your love and your kindness. As the, the song of meditation say, it's only you, it's only Jesus that could take away our sin and our darkness, dear Father. A very appropriate song for the message today as we look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about the gospel. And so, dear Father, we ask, dear, Lord, dear God, for your Holy Spirit to come and dwell with us, dear Father, to, to come down and tabernacle in between these pews, between each, touch each individual, dear Father, and so that whatever is said here through me, because I'm just a vessel, that each person will be blessed, dear Father. And I pray, dear God, that you will bring clarity that whatever I say, dear Father, there will be no confusion because it's coming straight from you. And so, dear God, I again just seek your presence. Be with us. Give me the confidence and put me behind your cross, dear Father, and let your words be seen. Let your truth be and your name be glorified. 
Again, thank you for dying for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So like I started to, to mention that um, we have dealt with some things here in Romans before. We have established that the, the human condition, Paul, um, in Romans um, chapter 1 to, to um, the beginning of 3, or 1 and 2, have established that we are in a sinful world, we are um, messed up, we are in this condition, and the only thing that can save us is Jesus. Um, Elder Peterson um, dealt with the, the fact that the Jews um, thought that they were better than the Gentiles, and we got some, some good messages there from, from that, that the Jews and the Gentiles, there are no difference. Um, one sin is not different from the other. Um, so this week we are going to pick up um, the scripture reading came from, from verse 24 to 31 of, of chapter 3. And that's where my focus is going to be. But I want to backtrack a little bit just to set the foundation here. So I'm going to backtrack um, if A.V. can put on the screen. Or you can turn your Bibles actually to, to Romans chapter 3 and keep it there for a while. We're going to be um, there for some time. I want to backtrack a little bit to set the foundation of, of the, the main point I want to make today. I'm going to backtrack to verse 21. So Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why is there no difference? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so the, the apostle here is, is, is addressing both Jews and Gentiles that there's no difference. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And we're going to stop there for a while. So having painted a, a dismal picture, like I mentioned, of the human race under sin, from Romans 1, verse 18 to, to 3, verse 20, actually, Paul introduces here in verse 21 the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 21, like I, I, I just read, said, um, Paul introduced it really in two words, but no. But now, in spite of its sinfulness, God has obtained a righteousness for sinful man, both Jews and Gentiles, that fully qualifies them for heaven, a righteousness by faith alone. So now, like I said again, we are going to be focusing on verse 24 to 31. But... Let me set the foundation with verse 21. I'll read it a second time. Just verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Some uh, translation says the righteousness of God apart from the law has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The King James Version used the word manifest. The, the American Standard Version used that. But there are other versions that say reveal. So manifest here means to, to, to make clear, to reveal. Now God has provided, I want to spend a little bit of time here to look at, just a few minutes to look at the law and the prophets testify. What does that mean? God has provided a way of salvation and the apostles showed that men 
is incapable of providing this salvation by any means of keeping the law. But God has provided and revealed his way. The righteousness of God is become available. This was foreshadowed and foretold in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system that we study in the Old Testament, because it was planned from the foundation of the world. So this gospel to be found in the laws and the prophets are, are revealed. Um, The law and the prophet are witnessed to this gospel that Paul is presenting here. Right? The but no. The but no also, by the way, suggests what? It suggests some historical aspect to this, right? Because if you read it carefully again, let me go back to it. It says, but no, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so... The point I want to make here is that the gospel or any preaching of the gospel which is not always clear as to the fulfillment of the one that is preached in the Old Testament is a very defective gospel. I will expound on that. The preaching which ignore the Old Testament is not true because this way of salvation that God has provided is the one in the Old Testament or that the Old Testament have been teaching about, have been suggesting, right? Therefore, the New Testament gospel is a fulfillment of the Old Testament which we have seen in the type and shadow as shown in the, in the Old Testament in the sacrificial system like I mentioned. What did Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17? Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then we're going to see further as we study in Romans what Paul really is talking about here. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but just we put all of this together um, in the end. So Jesus said that he's not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He has come to establish them. And we just read that the law and the prophets were a witness to this gospel that Paul just presented. This but no, um, God has revealed this, this, this gospel. The gospel that dismisses the sacrificial aspect of the Old Testament, like I mentioned, is defective. Or, if the gospel, there are some that says that the Old Testament view of God is inadequate and is defective, and that God of the Old Testament is just a tribal God of the Hebrews. Now, that's not the gospel because the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. The this salvation is manifested. It means, like I mentioned, it's been revealed. It's made clear now. It was suggested or showed to us before in type and shadow, in the sacrificial system. Um, I'm not sure if you have heard of, of, of this great preacher, E.J. Wagoner. Familiar with that name? E.J. Wagoner. Okay. Now... He says, let no one imagine that the gospel, that in the gospel he can ignore the law of God. The righteousness of God which is manifested apart from the law is witnessed by the law. It is such righteousness as the law witnesses to and commends. It must be so because the righteousness which Christ revealed and that came from the law which was in the heart. So although the law of God has no righteousness to impart to any man, we'll make that clear, and I'll, I'll clarify everything before we finish here. Just, just bear with me. So although the law of God has no righteousness to impart to any man, it does not cease to be the standard of righteousness. Therefore, or there can be no righteousness that does not stand the test of the law. The law of God must 
puts its seal of approval on everyone who enters heaven. Now when it comes to human righteousness, the Old Testament presents us with an apparent uh, paradox, a contradiction. Um, there are persistent and emphatic statements that nobody is righteous, that all have sinned. David pleaded in Psalm 143 verse 2 with God, do not bring your servant into judgment for no one living is righteous before you. Solomon acknowledged in his prayer at the dedication of the temple, there is no one who does not sin. That's 2 Chronicles 6 verse 36, if you want these texts to write down. That thought he repeats in Ecclesiastes 7.20. Solomon again repeated, there is not a righteous man on earth who does, not, who does what is right and never sins. Moses three times told the Israelites not to think that the law was giving them the land of Canaan because of their righteousness. To the contrary, Moses assert, you are a stiff-necked people. That's Deuteronomy 9, 4 to 6. So the paradox is that the same writers and the entire Old Testament make a distinction between two classes of human beings, the righteous and the wicked, are similar contrast in these distinctions, good, bad, right? This raises a crucial question. How can any human being be called righteous in face of the assertion that no one is righteous and that all have sinned? We gotta answer that question before we leave here today. The urgency of this question is intensified when we find people who are designated as righteous or blameless or a friend of God or highly esteemed, such as who? Noah, Job, Abraham, Daniel. Right? As having committed sin or confessing sin. But yet God called them, God said Job was a righteous man. It is evident that their righteousness is not identical to sinlessness. I need you to get these points. Because we're going to wrap this up and hopefully there is clarity to what Paul is saying in Romans. How then can they be called righteous or blameless? How can a man be just with God? The whole history of the Old Testament hinges on God's answer to this question. And the clear-cut answer is Yahweh, the covenant God, justifies all who believe in him, Amen. who trust his promises, who acknowledge their sin, who cast themselves on the mercy of God and turn away from their unrighteousness. Of Abraham we read, Abraham believed and the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. So what does that mean? What we're establishing here is that the same gospel that Paul is talking about in Romans is the same one in the Old Testament. What we're establishing here is that if you're saved by grace in the New Testament, Abraham was saved by grace. Abraham believed his right um, what we read in in romans is that you're justified by god freely right and abraham believed and that righteousness was a credit justification means the righteousness of god is now clothing you right and that's what the text here says in genesis 15 6. abraham believed and he, the lord accredited um credited to him as righteousness it means that abraham was saved by the same grace Job, of whom the Lord testified and he, that he was blameless and upright, a man who feared God and, ex, and shuns evil, was asked by the same Lord. If you read Job 40 verse 8, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Before the holy and righteous God, Job recognized his sinfulness and replied, my ears had heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and in ashes. David, the anointed of the Lord, when convicted of his sin against God through adultery and murder, confessed, 
his sins and found forgiveness. The second Samuel is 12 verse 13. According to Psalms 32 and Psalms 51. This is David. He was justified before God and could sing. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous. Sing all you are upright in heart. So this is justification by faith through grace alone. The righteousness of the righteous in the Old Testament is a gift from the righteous Lord. Amen. That is why David throughout the Psalms exalts the righteousness of God. We're studying Psalms now in our um, Sabbath school lesson. Paul stated the truth when he asserted that the law and the prophets testify to a righteousness from God apart from the law. Romans 3.21 which I'm emphasizing right now. Now, if we also look at Deuteronomy 25, verse 1, where the judges of Israel are commanded to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. It is clear that condemn must mean to declare to be wicked, not to make wicked. And that justify must mean to declare to be righteous and not to make righteous. Paul had only the Old Testament when he went to Thessalonica. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That's Acts 17, verse 2 and 3. And Timothy, who was a young man at that time that was um, working with Paul, Timothy had nothing in his childhood and youth but the Old Testament writings. And the apostle wrote to him, listen to this, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus. Paul is telling this to Timothy and he's saying that will make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus and Paul only had the Old Testament then go to the Old Testament this is E.J. Wagana quoting again he says then go to the Old Testament with the expectation of finding Christ in his righteousness there and you will be made wiser unto salvation. I think he's quoting from the scripture I just read. Do not discriminate between Moses and Paul, between David and Peter, between Jeremiah and James, between Isaiah and John. They are all saved by grace. As I wrap up this section before moving on, we see that the gospel in the New Testament was the same in the Old Testament. Abraham and Noah and others were all saved by grace and received the righteousness of God by believing. And it had nothing to do with law keeping. We cannot keep the law to be saved. But like I said, we're going to wrap this up in the end. Now, in, in verse 21 and I think also verse 24, we come across the word justified. And I want to, to, to spend a little time to explain this too. Now, if you remember, I just quoted Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. I'm going to read it now. It says, if there is a dispute or controversy between men, and they come to the court that the judge may judge them, justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked. That's Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. Now, what we see here is that justification is a legal term. Do we notice when we read Deuteronomy 25 verse 1 just now that they come to the court? So this is a legal word. It's associated with the judicial proceedings of the court of law. It refers to the positive verdict that a judge pronounces when a person is determined to be innocent of any charge or wrongdoing. It's a legal matter according to the law. The judge justifies those who have 
obey the law and condemn those who have disobeyed the law. Right? So as such, justification is, a, is the opposite of condemnation. It involves more than pardon, by the way. It involves more than forgiveness of sins. Did you know that? Justification is more than forgiveness of sins. Um, justification, like I said, is the positive declaration that a person is legally declared or counted as just or righteous. Right doing. Paul declares that sinners are righteous in God's sight, not because they are righteous in their experiences or their experience, but because God counts them as righteous on the basis of what was done for them in Christ. The phrase itself is a figure based on law. The transgressor of the law comes before the judge and is condemned to death for his transgressions. But, the good news here is, but a substitute appears and takes the transgressor's crimes upon himself, thus clearing the criminal. So by accepting the substitute, the criminal now stands before the judge, not only cleared of his guilt, but also regarded as never having committed the crimes for which he was first brought into court. And that's because the substitute who has a perfect record offers the pardon criminal his own perfect law keeping. So, if you look at my topic, what the law has to do with the gospel? I'm going to get to it. In the plan of salvation, each of us is a criminal. The substitute, Jesus, has a perfect record. And he stands in the court in our stead. His righteousness accepted in the place of our unrighteousness. Hence, we are justified before God, not because of our works, but because of Jesus whose righteousness becomes ours when we accept it by faith. Talk about good news. In fact, the news can't get any better than that. So the word justified, like the word condemned, is a legal term. With this in mind, now we'll go over to Romans 3.24, where we read that the righteousness of God in Christ justifies freely. And justifies whom? As mentioned in the last chapter, that's referring to chapter 2 of Romans, the word justified is linked to the word all. The word justified in verse 24 here is therefore objective truth applying to both Jews and Gentiles. Remember the context of what where Paul was writing here, right? Um, the whole human race, right? That's what he's talking about. Justify whom? The entire human race, not just the Jews. The Jews and the Gentiles. The moment a person believes in Christ, and accepts him by faith, God declares the person righteous. Amen. The believer may say, but I do not feel righteous. And I know I'm not righteous. But God declares the believer righteous, not because of their performance or feelings of righteousness, but because of his righteousness. It is the righteousness of God that justifies them. Romans 4 verse 5. Um, now remember in, in Romans 3 verse 19 where Paul tells us that according to the law, the whole world stands guilty before God. This means that the law of God condemns everyone, both Jew and Gentiles. But the moment a person believes Christ, the righteousness of God, which he obtained for all men in Jesus Christ is made effective and the believer stands justified. Watching my time there at the same time. <laughs> yes. So in, in, in ourselves, we stand condemned to death. But in Christ, we have passed from condemnation to justification. And this is the glorious message of justification by faith. The moment we believe the righteousness of Christ becomes effective on us, we pass from death to life, from condemnation to justification. 
Ellen White puts it like this. He has an interesting answer to the question, what is she rather? What is justification by faith? And she wrote, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man, for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. Means that we cannot do any, anything for that, for justification or for salvation. So we must be clothed with this righteousness of God to be admitted to heaven. Because there's not going to be any unrighteous there, right? Forgiveness alone will not do it. And that's why the gospel of justification by faith is important. Do you remember the man that went to the great feast, the wedding feast, and he did not have his wedding garment? What, what happened to him? He was thrown out. And there is going to be a wedding feast in heaven. So we have to have our garments. Second part I want to look at here is also in Romans 3.24. Keep it on the screen for me, A.V. Or keep it in your Bibles. Notice that this justification comes freely. Being justified freely. It comes without a cost. And Isaiah puts it like this. Isaiah says it is without money and without price. It is a free gift to the entire human race. For Paul tells us, being justified freely by his grace. Now, what does it mean by the phrase, by his grace? The word grace gives a very definite connotation to the word free. The primary word, or the primary meaning of the word grace, which I've learned this ever since I was in, uh, what's it? Sabbath school, when I was a kid, that it means unmerited or undeserved favor. That's the primary meaning. But grace, as used here, refers to the obedience of Christ, his life and death. When the word grace is used to mean unmerited favor, it actually implies more than simple undeserved rewards. Perfect example is when you give your kids gifts on special occasions. It may be an unmerited favor because they didn't do anything for the gift, right? But that is not grace. So grace is more than just unmerited favor. Grace is not only doing an undeserved favor. Grace is doing a special favor for an enemy, somebody who hates you, we imagine the scene of Jesus on the cross. Think about it. We imagine this scene as Jesus is crucified and we see some are spitting on him. Some are throwing, giving him vinegar to drink. Some are putting thorns on his head. But Jesus says, Father, forgive them. That is grace. So it's more than just an unmerited favor. Because these can be considered the enemies of Jesus, right? So when we come to Romans 5 verse 10, which is going to be probably a few weeks from now, we will discover that while we were still enemies of God, we were reconciled to him by his death of his son. That is grace. Did you hear what? He says when we were still enemies of God, that's when we were reconciled to him by the death of his son. So what incredible good news. God does not come to us and say, you need to straighten up yourself first or your life first. Show me evidence that you are trying to be good. Then I will justify you. No, God justifies us freely by his grace. This is why I wonder when I hear someone say, that I found Jesus. It has me wondering. I, I found Jesus. It, it has been the best thing or something of that sort since I found Jesus. You found Jesus? Jesus was not lost. 
We are the ones who are lost. And he came looking for us and has always been looking. So none of us found Jesus. He is the one who found us. The next thing I want to look at is this word redemption. Redemption, redemption was primarily a secular word commonly used in the Greek or Roman world to refer to the loosening of prisoners or the, the manumissions of slaves. It always involved the paying of a price to obtain a prisoner or a slave freedom. The concept of freedom costing something is also present in the Old Testament scriptures. You look in Leviticus and Exodus and you'll find it. Um, and it's even associated with God's redemption of his people. Redemption is one of the key metaphors Paul uses to describe salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.30, 6.20, 7.23 and Romans 8.23. Redemption in Christ Jesus. We are made righteous through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That is through the purchasing power that is in Christ Jesus or through the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's if Ephesians 3, 8, I'm quoting there. This is the reason why it comes to us as a gift. So from our perspective, it's a gift, it's free. But now we move on to an extremely important point. In Romans 3, 24, we read that God not only justifies us freely and graciously, but that this justification comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's read it. It's on the screen. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What do I mean by... Um, one second there. Um, so, so we see here that justification comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now... The, the same God who can redeem us is the same one who created us. That's why we as Seventh-day Adventists believe so much in this. Because we believe in the creation, the literal Seventh-day creation. But here is where redemption and creation part company. Here is where redemption and creation part company. I'm going to explain. What do I mean by this? Let me hasten to explain. You may be thinking that I forget the title, by the way, and I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. The, the, the New Testament clearly declares that Jesus created this world. He spoke and it happened. Right? John 1, 3. Jesus did not have to depend on pre-existing matter. According to Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were formed by God, by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So in other words, God made this world. He created this world out of nothing. We believe that the worlds were created without any pre-existing matter. For God's breath has energy. It's energy. So he spoke and it happened. But God could not redeem us by simple speaking. That's what I mean by redemption and creation parting company. God could not speak and redeem us. He had to send Jesus. And so God could not just come to us and say, yes, I know you have rebelled against me. I know that you are my enemies, but I love you in spite of your rebellious attitude. I love you unconditionally. And since I am sovereign, I'm God, I can speak, I will forgive your sins by excusing them. God cannot do this. Because the God we worship is a holy God. He is a just God. Even though he loves us unconditionally, he cannot redeem us. He cannot justify us by bypassing his law or the law wondering where I'm going. He cannot do it. 
His law tells us in Ezekiel 18 verse 20 that the soul that sins must die. I hope you're getting the picture. I cannot go too, 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 too much deeper. The soul that sins must die. So God could not speak justification or redemption, right? And we're going to find that there are some doctrines or some people that misunderstand this whole thing Paul is saying here. And that's why I'm setting the foundation. So... He's a just God. So even though he loves us unconditionally, he cannot bypass the law that he said before. Because why? Satan would just look at him now and say, see, you are an unjust, you're an unjust God. You're not living up to your words. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So what's the law got to do with the gospel? Everything I would say. Because God cannot bypass the law for Romans 3.24 to take place. Because it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of his, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And it's the same law that says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remissions of sins. Hebrew 9.22. Yeah. Suppose a policeman catches you speeding widely down the highway, but lets you go without writing us a ticket. The officer may be doing us a good turn, but in the end, he's being unjust, unless he himself volunteers to pay the fine of that ticket that we deserve. That's what Jesus did. God, unlike the forgiving policeman, is a just and cannot forgive us by simply excusing our sins. Yes, God's justification is free and gracious, but extremely costly to him. For we are told that we are justified through the redemption that is in Christ. And so from our perspective, it's free. But it costs God his son. If God were to give us a million dollars, wonderful as it might be, it would not cost him a thing, nothing. For God can speak and turn stone into gold. But he cannot justify us by simply speaking. And some, like I mentioned before, some liberal the theologians teach that God did not have to send his son and that Jesus did not have to die on the cross to forgive us. These theologians tell us that God is sovereign. He is love. He can forgive us by bypassing his law. They call it the moral influence theory. They said that Jesus dies only to influence us. That, the, that he really did not have to die to save us. This is not the teaching of the New Testament. Since the days of the apostle. The Christian church has come up with many theories of atonement, about the atonement. These include uh, such as the satisfaction theory. You would have to go research these. I'm not going to stay on these. The ransom theory, the moral influence theory that I just mentioned. Each claims to have the cor correct understanding of atonement. But what they don't understand is that the atonement is too big and even to be locked up in one theory. We will spend eternity wrestling with the atonement. Each of us, or each of these theories rather, has an aspect of truth. They become wrong, or they become hearsay only when they deny the others. The truth is that God's love and justice both meet at the cross. It was at the cross that God demonstrated his love, but it was likewise at the cross that God became legally empowered to justify the ungodly. I'm looking at the time and see what to skip. <laughs> Just bear with me there. So redemption refers to the price that was paid and the debt 
that was canceled due to our Lord's sacrificial death on, on Calvary. Right? Um, God has set the sinner free through Christ, but he has not done so by setting aside the rules. He cannot. So again, what's the law got to do with the gospel? As a matter of fact, there can't be any gospel without the law. Amen. Cannot be. I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead of myself. But in, in Romans, we also know that what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. That's towards the end of the sermon, by the way. I think I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> but since I'm here, so you cannot have the gospel without the law. Right? Sin is the transgression of the law. If there is no law, sin does not exist. And you do not need the gospel if there is no sin. So for those who say that God has done away with the law on the cross, they are misunderstanding what Paul is saying. There's a law that was nailed to the cross. And it's the one I refer to as the sacrificial system, the ceremonial law, the Sabbaths. The, the, there are some different things. Not the Sabbath day, by the way. There are different Sabbaths with an S that they, they, they used to um, have in the Old Testament there. And, and different um, things. The, the Old Testament was just a shadow. The sacrificial system, rather. The lamb that was sacrificed. All of that, if you study that carefully, it was just a foreshadow of what was to come. Christ is the ultimate lamb. So because of the cross of Calvary, God can declare sinners righteous and still be considered just and fair in the eyes of the universe. If it wasn't for the, for, for the cross, if it wasn't for, for Calvary, if it wasn't for Jesus, God could not do that and still be considered a just God. Right? Satan can point no accusing finger at God. For heaven has made the supreme sacrifice. Satan had accused God of asking the human race more than he is willing to give. The cross refutes this claim. Now we see why Jesus had to die on the cross and could not just use the sovereign power to forgive sin and exclude the law or ex um, forgive sins and put the law or the rules away. All right, I'm going to skip this section here. <laughs> so now I want to get to somewhere down at Romans 3.27. Because we're heading to, to, to um, 31. So Romans 3.27. Paul reminds the believer that there is no boasting in the justification by faith. Paul does say in 1 Corinthians 1.31 that Christians can indeed boast, but only in Christ and for what he has done for us. But here in Romans 3.27, there is no human boasting, for salvation is entirely through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, received by faith. Paul therefore concludes in Romans 28, for we, for we are maintained that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. We must pause here because many misunderstand this phrase, works of the law. You see, the, the word, or the English word, legalism, do we know that what I mean? Legalism is where we're using the law as a method of salvation. Um, it has no equivalent in the New Testament Greek. But whenever we come across the phrase, works of the law, especially in the Pauline writings, we can be assured that the author is referring to the use of the law as a method or means of salvation, and that is legalism. Paul, however, upholds the law as a standard of Christian living, if you read Romans 13, 8 to 10. But here, Paul tells us that justification by faith comes freely from God, with no contribution on our part. Our law-keeping contributes nothing whatever or whatsoever to our salvation. This he says in Romans 3, 29 and 30. 
applies to both Jews and Gentiles. What does the apostle mean by saying without the law or apart from the law? This is very important because, like I said, it has been misinterpreted and misunderstood in this way. There are those who say it means this. The God, that God has done away with his law forever. It does not exist anymore and God has abrogated or abolished or retracted the law. There are some that say that. You've heard it. From the coming of Jesus into this world, the law ceased to be and does not have any importance and does not apply to anybody. You've heard that teaching too. You may have heard people putting it like this. They say, until Christ came and did his work, the law was preached and they were, um, we, were, we were judged according to our conformity to the law, whether we obey the law or disobey the law. Right? We are justified or condemned. But they say that this is no longer the case. What judges men know is the law of God. What, what judges men know is not the law of God. Rather, I knew something was wrong there. <laughs> what matters now is if you believe in Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing that matters. Remember what I'm reading here is what others thinking. It's not what I'm saying. It's just the views of others. So they say what matters now is that we only believe in Jesus Christ and that's the only thing that matters. That's what they say. Indeed, they go as far to say this because mankind had failed to keep the law. God has brought in something simpler and easier. <laughs> just believe in then the law has no standard at all. That, I suggest, is a very serious misinterpretation. And of course, if anybody have ever read the last verse in this chapter, put it on the screen for me, A.V., verse 31. If anyone have ever read this verse, they should have never, ever fallen into that trap. Let's read it. Do you then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Oh, I'm reading a different version. Sorry. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. If anybody had ever read the conclusion of this chapter, they should never have fallen into that trap. So whatever your understanding of what apart from the law or without the law means, it should never say that it was abolished. It should never say it was abrogated. It should never say it was done away with. In any form, it does not mean that. As a matter of fact, it is the opposite. The text says that it was established or we establish it. And we know what that means, so I'm not going to expound on that. Well, the question is, what does it mean when it says apart from the law? This is what it is. That our keeping of the law perfectly ourselves as a means of salvation is entirely set aside. Not because the law no longer apply, but because another had rendered his perfect obedience to the law on our behalf. Do you see why I was setting the foundation? Because now we're in Romans and Paul is talking. Right? So we see here that, in other words, no longer must anyone think of saving himself. Because that's what the Jews thought, right? And Paul was writing to them and, and clarifying things and saying, you are both under the same um, situation, both Jews and Gentiles. So, in other words, no longer must anyone think of saving himself or achieving salvation in terms of his own doings. So then my topic, then what's the law got to do with the gospel? Let's read verse 20. Verse 20, we're going back now. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
When we study the Bible, we should study a little here, a little there, and put it together in the whole context. And this year is saying that, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You cannot have the gospel without the law. It's impossible. Because the law is what points you to the gospel. The law tells us that we're living in a sinful situation and we need help. And where do we get help? From God. Right? Going to Jesus, accepting him. So, so, to be under the law means to be under the jurisdiction of the law. The law, however, reveals a person's shortcomings and guilt before God. The law cannot remove the guilt. The law cannot do that. It cannot remove that guilt. What it can do is lead the sinner to seek a remedy for it. Our view of salvation should not be one that dismisses the law, but it should be one that establishes the law. The Jew or the Gentile must not for a moment think that they can keep the law to be saved. Nothing they can do can ever satisfy God. And that is putting yourself back under the condemnation of the law. Because the law of God is still what judges us. I'm looking at the time again. I guess we need to turn the clock the other way. Um, let's go over to verse 31. I'm, I'm skipping some things that I prepared here, but um, then in verse 31, he concludes with an important question, which we, we touched on just now. Do we then nullify the law through faith? The answer is, it may never be, or in the King James Version, God forbid, on the contrary, we establish the law. So Romans 3.31 has brought confusion to some Christians because of its use of the word faith. I'll just clarify this quickly. But here the word faith is preceded by the original or definite article, the. Paul is really asking, do we make void or do we nullify the law through faith? Here the word faith refers not to, be, not to the believer's faith, but to the doctrine of justification by faith, which Paul just explained. Right? And so Paul in Romans 3.28, um, where he says that we are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now he asks the question, for he is aware that the believers in Rome, especially the Jewish believers, will accuse him of undermining the law or undermining justification by faith in terms of the legal aspect of the law. So he asks, does the doctrine of justification by faith bypass the law? Do, do away with the law or nullify the law? And the answer is unthinkable. God forbid, it can never be so. James 2 verse 10 says, God's law is the standard of the judgment. And that was about 30 years after the cross, by the way. At court, they judge you out of the law. God has a standard for his judgment, which is his law. Romans 3.20, we just read that. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Um, where there is no law, there is no sin, for sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, there is no law. If there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, if there is no... This is important. Let me slow down. If there is no law and there is no transgression, guess what? If there is no law, the devil can be saved. And if he's going to be there, I'm going to stay here. Paul does that mean that our performance establishes the law. For our performance never measures up. He made that clear. It never measures up to the full demand of the law. The law, after all, demands two unattainable things from every sinner. Perfect obedience and perfect justice. No human being born under sin can measure up to these standards. So let me clear up this. Give me just a few minutes. Let me tell. Because some people think Adventists are legalistic and, and so forth. Um, let me make it clear as to where we stand. Um, 
or my understanding rather, let me not talk on behalf of the church. We read, so we be I believe that it is this obedience of love to which Paul refers to when he writes, love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13.10. Again, this is all Paul's writing. So, so while we are Christians or, or other people think that our obedience comes from, or, or we keep in the law, is because we are being illegalistic and we're keeping the law to be saved, that's not what we're doing and that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that we are saved, or what we understand in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in what Paul's writings here, we are saved by grace through faith. We cannot do anything to save ourselves. But when we are saved, because the law and the gospel, they are linked together, you will do what God asks us to do. Amen. Another deception that was now brought forward. Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice and that death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. Had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. But to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under Satan's control. It was because the law was changeless, because man could be saved only through the obedience to his precepts that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. So it's the, it's the opposite of what um, some people are thinking. Yet, the very means by which Christ established the law, Satan represented it as destroying it. Do you see that? Here will come the last conflict and the great con of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. I'm going to conclude now. So I say the word in summary. So you know I'm coming down. I, I'm just giving you three or four points and then come down. In summary, the gospel of the New Testament is the same gospel of the Old Testament. They were saved also by grace through faith and not by any works of the law keeping in the Old Testament. We've gave many examples. I've gave many examples. Nothing we can do can earn our salvation. Point number two, not Sabbath keeping. And guess what? Not vegetarianism. <laughs> Nothing we can do can save us. But when we are saved, we will do what our Father asks us to do. The most important point is that the gospel and the law cannot be separated. If you don't get anything else, that was my title. They cannot be separated. And the gospel of the New Testament cannot ignore the gospel as foretold or foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Jesus had to come as a human to show perfect obedience to the law, then go to the cross as our substitute. In other words, God had to qualify Jesus to be our savior by the mystery of the incarnation. He could not just forgive our sins by speaking like he did in creation because God had to follow the rules that he himself set. Otherwise, he would be accused by Satan and his angels that are watching on just to find a fault to accuse God. So make sure you get those points. Hence, the laws of God are still binding and we do not keep them to be saved, but we are saved. But when we are saved, we keep them because now we are followers of Jesus Christ and whatever he says or asks, we will do. Otherwise, we are just a disobedient child of God. And none of us as parents wants a disobedient child. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, dear God. I thank you that you could use a vessel to bring you, an unworthy vessel like me to bring your words today, dear Father, or your message. And so, dear God, I pray that there is no unclear things that I've said here, but I pray that Whatever I've said, there is clarity. And if there is anything unclear, I pray that we will go back to the scriptures 
and study with the author of the scripture, the Holy Spirit. As we come to you now, dear Father, we continue to pray for, the, for us as we leave that you will be with us and bring us back safely in the afternoon, dear Father. Be with each individual here. Continue to bless us, continue to guide us and help that as a result of today's message that our life will be changed and will grow closer to you realizing that we cannot do anything to be saved because you have taken you are you have sent your son to be that substitute for us bless us now and keep us through the remaining portion of your sabbath day in jesus name we pray amen, amen.